If you have your Bibles with you this morning or your phone or whatever you use to trap Scripture, we're looking at Matthew chapter 5. We're in this, we're in this series called The Good Life. And uh, we're looking at, we're at this place in the Sermon on the Mount where we're, we're looking at the six case studies that Jesus gives and saying, okay, how do you live out this righteousness that I have for you? Very practical things that he's talking about. He's talked about anger, and he's going to talk about integrity, and he's going to even talk about loving your enemies, which, okay, uh, not that we have any of those, right? But today, today, can I tell you, out of this whole series, this was the message I was most apprehensive to preach and to talk about. Um, it, it used to be I would be sensitive to this subject simply because sexuality is such a private matter. But I'm also sensitive to it today because it's such a divisive subject now. There are all kinds of different perspectives from folks. And... Uh, so I want you to know that I come at this with two perspectives. Number one, I want you to understand that I have a pastor's heart. I come with compassion. And uh, I've been your pastor now for a long time. And so I want you to still, you, you know that I love you and I care about you. And uh, I'm always concerned about our people and helping you on the journey of taking the next step toward Jesus. That's the desire of my heart. The second thing I want you to know, though, but I have a responsibility to God's truth. And we need to talk about what does God say about this very, very important issue. And whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, um, whether you're married or single, if you will listen to this message, I may save you a significant amount of heartache. God may save you a significant amount of heartache. I believe that when it comes to sexuality, Americans believe that we are more progressive than anyone or any culture in the history of humanity. And we pat ourselves on the back about that in regards to human sexuality. And yet, can I tell you, not only were you not the most progressive, it was even more progressive in the time of Jesus. Can you believe that? Dr. Scott McKnight is a theologian, has written a number of books, commentaries, and articles. And he describes in his book, A Fellowship of Different, he describes an eye-opening walk that he had through the city of Pompeii. You might remember Pompeii was destroyed by a volcano in AD 79. And, and what he says is that it, it, that volcano left a vivid snapshot of the culture of the first century. And, he, and this is how he, he describes the Roman culture in the first century. He says, I'm going to got that quote for me, Aaron. It is not an exaggeration to say that the city was swamped in erotic images. The sexual reality across the empire, of which Pompeii was a typical example, was a total lack of sexual inhibition. They had temple worship that was part of that. And so, okay, we have media, but it stared them in the face every day. It's what they were exposed to. And, and the normal things, the normal order of the first century was that for most men and some women, they might have procreational sex with their spouse, but they had recreational sex with whoever they wanted to. Uh, recreational sex included pedophilia, lesbianism, homosexuality, and prostitution. Cicero, who was Rome's most famous orator, reflected on this, this time period, and he said this, when was such a thing not done? In other words, this was the norm, accepted by the culture. It seems that Las Vegas has nothing on first century Rome. This is what the church was born into. Ecclesiastes was right. There is nothing new under the sun. So, question. What shapes your view of sexuality? 
What's your filter? What's forming that? The early church's sexual ethic was revolutionary. Adhering to it made for a community of people who were to be salt and light. They were to be different, unique. What I'm going to share with you may seem radical to you. We, as a culture, are not far off from Cicero's insights. It seems it's just the norm. We live in a day where our identity is found in our sexuality. We don't find our identity in the creator, but rather in the type of sexual expression that we choose to participate in, whatever that may be. And it's into that culture that Jesus speaks to the, these people of uh, the marginalized, the poor, the broken, and let me tell you, some of them would have been participating in this, and he speaks these words, and so it's, it's, it's resonating with them, and there might even be a sense of conviction in the midst of it. And so Jesus, Jesus in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, says this. Again, these six case studies. You have heard it said unto you, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Adultery with her in his heart. And we're going to look at what does that word lustfully mean? We'll take a look at that in just a little bit. But I've mentioned that Jesus is explaining to us the deep work of the Holy Spirit to bring heart holiness, to set people apart that reflect the image of Jesus. If you look at these six case studies, and you go back to the Beatitudes, you will find how they begin to align. In many ways, when Jesus is talking about sexuality, he's talking about what it means to be pure in heart. And, and I want you to see three truths from this text, three things I want us to indicate. And I, and, I, and I think they are very pertinent to today. The first I want you to see is called the power of the eyes. The power of the eyes. In 2017, there was a group of teenage boys who were walking through a grocery store and they saw this cake in, in this display case. And they thought to themselves, we, we want, we want this cake. And so they schemed up a way to do it. They got in, stole the cake, they're on their way out and the police catch them. But here's the problem. They didn't steal a real cake. They, start, they stole a cardboard display of a real cake. How do you convict them of that? Their eyes had deceived them into thinking that the image that they were looking at was real. And it wasn't. Jesus said that our eyes are like a lamp for our body. If, if our eyes are good and our body is healthy, but if our eyes are unhealthy, our body will be full of darkness. Lust is our eyes grasping a false image of what sexuality is all about. Now, now, we need to understand what lust is. Lust is not the attraction to someone who's beautiful and appreciating their beauty. We're all wired that way. When it moves from appreciation to lust is when we begin to dwell on that, when we begin to undress them with our eyes and long for something that does not belong to us and say, if I could, I would. It's a whole different mentality. Lust, lust is different than love. Love is about the other person. Lust is about self-gratification. Love is about the journey together. Lust is about the moment. Love is about selflessness. Lust is about stealing. Love is about giving. When David was the king of Israel, he was supposed to be, evidently there were seasons to go to war. And in, in 2 Samuel 11, it says that when, when David's army was, it's springtime when David's army was to go out to war, David was supposed to be with his army. Had he been with his army, what happened would not have happened. He was not where he should be. And so it's the afternoon. He's been taking a nap. I'm all for naps. 
and he gets up out of his nap and he goes out into his balcony. He looks over the city that he helps to lead and direct and he sees a woman and she's bathing and it's midday and, and he looks at her and he looks again and, and he looks at one of his servants and he says, come here. Who is that? Go find out who that is. And the guy comes back and says, that is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. At that moment, he could have said, off limits. Can't do anything about that. Instead, he said, go get her. Go get her. And he used his power and his position and his authority to take advantage of her. And you know the rest of the story. When the heart is in the darkness, it will deceive itself and think what it's doing is right. Satan is the father of lies. In 2016, listen to this, 2016, the world spent four billion hours viewing pornography. Four billion. It is a 72 billion global industry and a 10 to 13 billion uh, of that is spent in the United States. This stuff gets deep inside of us. It gets into our heart. It produces chemical reactions in our body and we long for it, but it's deceptive. Now in this context, Jesus is speaking specifically to men in many ways. In ancient times, women would be held accountable if adultery occurred, but men, men could be as promiscuous as they would like. And, and you can see women are vulnerable at this stage. Women are vulnerable in the eyes of men are leaving their heart astray. And it wasn't just affecting a person or a couple. It was affecting a culture. The eyes, the eyes, when I look at and what I meditate on will shape my heart. What I look at and what I meditate on will shape my heart. I remember David praying this prayer, and it's a dangerous prayer because it's a prayer of wanting to change. He says in Psalms 51, which we believe is a psalm in response to his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So, question, what's the condition of your eyes? What's the condition of your eyes? It doesn't matter what age you are, okay? Um, what's the condition of your eyes? I know that Jesus is speaking to men, but there is an increase also in the exposure of pornography to women. So, the power of the eyes. Number two, the sacredness of the body. The sacredness of the body. In ancient times, especially in the Greek culture, it was thought that the body and the soul are separate. And you could do whatever you wanted with the body because it was your soul that was connected to your living spirit or to the gods. God's story says something different about the body. It says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It says that what you do with your body matters. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 17. I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are, would you say that the next statement with me? members of Christ himself. So shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a the prostitute? Say it with me with emphasis. Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. When we when we engage in a sexual relationship, we give part of ourselves away. How do I know that? 
Well, um, let's just create a scenario. Let's say there, there's a couple that have been dating and they're sexually active, and, but the, the relationship doesn't work and they break it off. A year or two later, he's dating somebody and they're getting engaged to be married and they're out and about in the community and they happen to run in to the old girlfriend. How are the feelings in that moment? How comfortable is that conversation? And why is it uncomfortable? Why? Because we're not just bodies. Our minds and our emotions all play a part in the sexual experience that God has created. And so it becomes uncomfortable because we've shared ourselves. When we become followers of Jesus, we're declaring that our body is not our own and our desires and our wills belong to him and we align our actions with him. It's the sacredness of the body. The third thing I want you to see is the sanctity of sex and marriage. Now, Let's be clear. Let's be clear. Uh, the Bible, the Bible is not anti-sex. In Genesis 2.24, the writer says that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And, and by the way, that word become is the idea you will spend the rest of your life becoming. Because the wedding day is just a celebration but you'll, and, and the promises, but you'll spend the rest of your life living into those promises. From the beginning, God created sex to bring a couple together. Matter of fact, did you know there is a whole book in the Bible that talks about romance? It's called the Songs of Solomon. And I remember when I was in Biblet 101, C.S. Coles was the professor. And they take you through the different books of the Bible. You're kind of looking at the Bible at 30,000 feet. And he, he gets to Songs of Solomon. He says, let me tell you what you guys are going to do today. You're going to go back to your dorm room, shut your blinds, and read that book. I'm not going to tell you what I did. It's none of your business what I did after that class. When Paul speaks about human sexuality and he even talks that when he talks about marriage he will say to a couple don't let there be a lot of time in between your love for one another sharing your love for one another because that can create temptation Christianity or God is not anti-sex and Christianity elevated sex and made it more than just an act, but rather a respectful encounter between two people who have chosen to marry one another. I love this quote by Oswald Chambers. <laughs> the Bible insists on purity, not prudery. Kind of old English, but you get the point. The Bible isn't anti-sex. Pornography creates a false image of sexuality. We bring those images into our sacred encounter with our spouses, and it promotes a lie. God wants to protect your eyes so that he can protect your heart. If you're a single adult, you might be saying to yourself, well, I will stop whatever, whenever I get married. That's a lie. Not only will you walk into your marriage with those images, which are not reality, you probably won't stop. I know that... Pastor Connie, in several weeks from now, is going to speak about marriage. But let me say this to the single adult. If you're thinking that one day you want to get married, I love, we, we, Pastor Lauren helped me form this. Live like the person you want to marry would want to marry. Right now, today, live like the person you would want to marry would want to marry. It's, it'll play in your head. You stay with it. You write that down. Take it home with you today. You'll get it, I promise. Why did God create marriage? Uh, because he knew we needed each other. Now, marriage, let me hear this loud and clear. Marriage is not the end game. Eternity with Jesus is the end game. Relationship with Jesus is the end game. However, for some, marriage will play a significant role in their lives. And marriage is not just a commitment between two people. It's something that is to be expressed in community. That's when we have a wedding ceremony. We stand up here, there are friends on one side, friends on another in a congregation. 
And those, you'll watch when I do a wedding ceremony, I intentionally speak to the, to the bridesmaids and the groomsmen because I want to remind them, you're responsible to help this couple on the journey. And we come along, we pray for each other, and we encourage. And I tell a congregation, you got to pray for this couple because the enemy's going to do everything he can to bust them up. So we come alongside. By the way, okay, I, I told you we're not any different than first century, right? So we all know that, right? And we understand that Christianity has this revolutionary piece to it. If you think that living together makes you more prepared for marriage, that's a lie. Just do your own homework. Go and research it. The statistics show living together does not cause you to have a better marriage or even make for a good nurse, because here's what happens. You live with this sense of fear. Well, if I do the wrong thing, if I say the wrong thing, they'll just leave. There's something about standing up before folks and making promises, making vows. Those are sacred words. Pornography will affect your marriage. One study on a prolonged consumption of pornography found this. Let me give you this quote. It says, Exposure lowered the evaluation of marriage, making this institution appear less significant and less viable in the future. In other words, pornography degrades the sacredness of marriage. So how do we move forward? Thank you, Pastor Tim, for covering this subject matter. Now, okay, blessed, go home. How do, we, how do we move forward? What do we do? How do we live into being kingdom of God people? Do we remember that's what we're all about here? How do we be, be kingdom of God people? And so uh, I want you to read. Uh, Jesus gives some <laughs> pretty vivid illustrations. Let me read them and then comment on it, okay? So he says in Matthew 5, 29 and 30, if your right eye causes you to stumble, <laughs> gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, do I think that Jesus is being literal to say, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye? No, no. But he is saying this is a serious matter and we have to take it seriously. They say that when you want to repair eyesight, matter of fact, I have a family member who's going to do this, they can do laser eye surgery. So here's some laser eye surgery for us today as we're talking about the power of the eyes and as Jesus is speaking here. What are some things that we can do to take this subject seriously as people of God, the kingdom of God people in a world that's flooding us with images? We're not much different than Pompeii. There's just other methods by which to show it. Right? So what do we do? First of all, I think it starts with confession. In the book of James, it says that when anyone is sick to call the elders and that, uh, that part of the healing was to confess your sins to one another, this, this subject is the secret sin of the church. We don't want to mention it because we feel guilty and ashamed. I believe, and in my experience as a pastor, is that uh, Satan loves secrets and he loves isolation. If he can get you working in your own head all by yourself, he's got you right where he wants you. So if you've got an issue with this, I encourage you to go to a friend who holds the same values as you do, who isn't going to look you and pack you on the back and say, oh, hey, everybody's doing it. No. Who lives by the same values you do and share what you're dealing with. It could, be, it could be a friend, it could be a pastor, it could be a mentor. At some point, David decided after his sin with Bathsheba that he needed to write a poem. Psalm 51 is that. Sexual sin is not the unpardonable sin. Okay? You can be forgiven. God can renew your eyesight. He can renew your heart. He's in the business of doing that. This is a difficult issue because we're so flooded in the culture that it feels like it's just 
the natural thing. It's, it's what happens. But God wants to clean our hearts, purify our hearts. The second would be community. Get a group of people around you who may be going through this battle and, and meet on a regular basis, on a regular, did I say on a regular basis? Meet on a regular basis to encourage one another. Uh, remember that as far as pornography is concerned, this is a bit like an alcoholic. It really is. There is a chemical reaction that occurs, and you start to thrive for that reaction. Um, we're going to be publishing our fall catalog in uh, next Sunday, I believe it is, and you will see that one of the groups we're offering is in partnership with Christian Life Fellowship, who I just so appreciate that church. Um, and it's going to be, there'll be a, a small group on, uh, on purity. And I would encourage you. And going there doesn't mean you have a problem. See, I think that's the fear. If I show up and somebody thinks I'm going through that door, they're going to think, you have a problem. And it's just all, you might as well wear the shirt going in with all, the, you know. We, we feel like everybody's just going to see it and they're going to judge me. I get it. Um, but this is all about needing support. And if you're a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend and, and comes to the place that you find out on this, um, our, our tendency is to be so angry that we, we kick them in the ribs while they're down. Help them to get healthy. It will be hard. There's trust that's been broken. But when we get so angry that we just, we just keep attacking, um, that's not going to help bring, to bring healing. Uh, come alongside and help the relationship to grow. Confession, community, counseling. If this, if, this is, uh, if this is an issue that, okay, I've tried some good friends, I've, I've been praying, sometimes we need to unpack some stuff. And this is not pastoral counseling. This is professional counseling. Uh, most of us as pastors, we don't have the skills. There might be a few, but I know I don't have them in my toolbox. And I'm the first to tell you. But I do have recommendations. And, what, you know, you may go to a counselor the first time and you don't connect. So you say, oh, I'm done with that. No, go find somebody else. But find that person who can help you on this journey. And they may, they may discover some things that's been triggers in this and give you more uh, tools for you to be able to say yes to God and no to sin. Fourth one is constraint. When I have people who walk into my office and share with me this journey that they're on, one of the first things I will have them do is I'll ask them, do you have anything like, do you have, what do you have on your phone, on your computers that prevents you from going down this road? So there's a program called Covenant Eyes. That's one that I will recommend quite a bit. You're going to have a monthly subscription fee and such like that. But what it does is it, it puts up, for instance, you could get a, a, a partner with, on you that, that if you go and look at something you shouldn't look at, it will notify that person and let them know. And then they'll, their whole idea to call is to encourage, not to beat up. But it's the idea that I want to say no to this, and yet it's so hard. I'm convinced today it is not a matter of if a child is going to be exposed to pornography. It is a matter of when. Because our computers are just, it's, it's all over. Constraint. Consecrate. Consecrate. That's the idea of surrender. Uh, let me share with you the rest of 1 Corinthians 6. Verses 18 through 20. Would you say the first word with me? Flee. Yeah. That's not little bugs on you. Flee. That's a command. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive with God, from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And for some of us today, it may be looking and saying, you know, I've tried to separate mind and body, and I've realized that I've compromised. 
And it might be coming to confession and saying, Jesus, forgive me. I commit not just my emotions, my mind, but my body as well. It belongs to you. You know, what I'm really talking about setting up is safeguards. It's like a, it's like a net. You know, if you've watched a trapeze artist, the trapeze artist knows that I, I may miss, but I have a net. And what, when we, we set up groups together and we're in counseling together um, and we're in a community together and we're worshiping together, those are all, those are all places where we're setting, creating nets a safety net that can, again, help us to say yes to God and no to sin. Some of you might remember the Christian artist Rich Mullins. He was a Christian musician and songwriter who died tragically in 1997 at the age of 41. He admitted at a concert he had a struggle with pornography. And he tells the story about being on tour and, he, and to, to help him work through his, his struggle with pornography, he would bring a friend with him. And uh, they were in Amsterdam. And he, he realized they were not very far from the red light district in Amsterdam. And so they got into the room, and there was time for bed. And he had it in his mind. He says, if my friend can just start snoring tonight, I'll know he's asleep and I can sneak out and make my way down to the red light district and enjoy the scenery. His friend just never started snoring. Slept clearly through the night. But Mullins struggled in his mind. He waited till five in the morning. But during the night, as he struggled, he took a pen and paper and began to write. It's a song that if you've been on Christian radio, you've probably heard it. But this is the chorus. I never knew, I never knew it was a connection to his struggle. He said, and I wake up in the night and feel the dark. It's so hot inside my soul. I swear there must be blisters on my heart. So hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaken like a leaf. You have been my king of glory. Would you say the last line with me? Won't you be? Yeah. Yeah. And God has the ability to do that.